All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Algebra 2. This year it's working a little bit differently. I was just explaining that to the students who are here in person. So if you are in here in person, you are being projected up on the main screen, all the slides that you guys are seeing. So just know that when you type in the chat area, the students who are here with me live can see what you're chatting and the questions that you're asking, which is fine. So don't be discouraged to ask questions. But just know that we're kind of doing two things at once this year. You guys are watching live online, and we also have students who are live in person watching the same session. So we're going to go ahead and jump in and get going. If you're watching from home, did anybody print out the slides that I sent you this morning through Kmail? Maybe give me a green check mark or a red X. All right, if not, it's not a big deal. It just saves us time from copying all the slides down. So the first thing that we need to do is everyone needs to write down our essential question. So that is down here at the bottom for week three. So let me give you a quick moment to do that. Even when I share the notes with you, I don't give you the essential question because I want you to come live and write that down. So we take a couple seconds and copy down our essential question. One big bonus of coming in person, which I haven't even told these guys yet, is that when you're in person, you're automatically going to get your full 10 points for the week. You don't even have to submit your essential question. So hopefully that will make you want to be here. It doesn't mean you don't take notes, right? And it doesn't mean you don't try. It just means that I can supervise what you're doing. So if you are in person in front of me, you will automatically get full credit each week. All right, that will be up again at the very end, so if you didn't quite get a chance to finish copying it, you will have another opportunity to do so. We're going to do a little review of last week. So think these through, A, B, C, or D, which term is not used to represent a polynomial equation? So if you're from home, go ahead and type in your polling answer. If you're in person, can you write your answer down on your paper? Which term is not used to represent a solution? It's just a quick vocabulary check. It's okay if we don't know. That's why you need me. <laughs> So the word solution is the same as root, it's the same as x-intercept, it's the same as zero. So the only word that does not work is constant. Let's think about what a constant is. A constant just means a plain old number. So that is not a word that represents a solution. All of the others do. So sometimes in your quizzes, they're going to say, find the root. Sometimes they'll say, find the x-intercept. Sometimes they'll say find the zero. All of those mean the exact same thing. And we're going to practice that today. So this is what we covered last week. You don't need to copy this down. This is in your notes from last week that I shared with you. We learned about this remainder theorem. And what we learned is that when I divide using synthetic division, which we'll practice again this week, if I ended up with a remainder, that means that that is just a point on my graph. So if I were to go and graph 2, 13, that would be a point for this crazy graph. So if there's a remainder, what does a remainder mean? That means that this is a point on my graph. A quick, quick review from last week. Then we learned, hey, if I end up with a 0, that is also a point on my graph, but it's a special kind of point on my graph. So if my remainder is 0, that means that negative 1 is a solution. And on the flip side, x plus 1 would be a factor. 
So we learned two things last week. We learned that if I don't have a zero there, it's a point on my graph. But if I do have a zero, then it's, it is a point on my graph still, but it's a special kind of point. It's the solution. It's the root. It's the next intercept. It's all those words we just talked about. So we're going to take a quick minute and do a quick summary. So here are the big ideas from last week. Can you guys, everybody, take a minute and see if you can fill in my blanks? This was actually your essential question last week, so I'm just making sure everybody hit the nail on the head. So what does it mean when there's a remainder? What does it mean when the remainder is zero? So let's all take a minute and answer those two questions before we move on. Okay, so let's check our summaries. Let's see if we did this correctly. So when I have a remainder, you should have written, and thank you, McKenna, great answers in the comment area there. So when there is a remainder, it means it is a point on the graph. When the remainder is zero, it means that it is, it's a point on the graph, but it's also a solution. Any questions about the difference between those two things? Are everybody okay with that? We'll practice synthetic division in just a second. Okay, so we're going to try one now. Example one says determine whether the binomial expression is a factor of f of x. So when we do our synthetic division, what we learned last week is that if it tells me my factor is x plus 2, what number am I supposed to write outside my synthetic division? A negative 2. Good job. Because when we're using synthetic division, we are always using the solutions. We're using the root. We're not using the factor. Let's kind of go back for just a second. If I told you x plus 1 is a factor, the solution would be negative 1. Everybody okay with that? Remember when it's inside parentheses, that's called a factor. The solution is when you set it equal to 0. So it's the opposite of what you see. So if right here, if my factor is x plus 2, my solution would be a negative 2. Then what we learned last week for synthetic division is I take each of my coefficients and I'm going to write them in my chart. So I'm going to have a 2, a 12, an 8, a negative 5, and a negative 10. Do we remember the weird trick from last week though? I know Kayla remembers. What's, what do I need to look for with my x's? that they're all in order, in descending order, right? That I have a 4, a 3, a 2, a 1, and then none. What happens if I was missing one? I would have to put in a, a 0. I'd need a placeholder. So let's try some synthetic division. We're going to drop my 2 straight down. And then we'll say negative 2 times 2 is a negative 4. Add straight down. This is why we love synthetic division. Remember, long division was super long, and this way was much, much nicer. Negative 2 times 8 is negative 16. Let's add straight down. Negative 2 times negative 8 is a positive 16. Let's add straight down. Negative 2 times 9, negative 18 and add straight down. So by the time I'm done, I got negative 2 comma negative 28. So that means what? It's not a solution, but it's a point on the graph. So I, I need to write out for myself, not a solution, not a factor. It's not any of those things. 
but it is still a point on the graph. Questions? Oh, I made a mistake in my edition, right? See, this is why you guys are here. You're supposed to stop me. Instead of giving me a weird look, you've got to tell me. <laughs> it doesn't really change anything. So negative 2 times 11 is negative 22. So we'd get negative 32. There's no eraser and illuminate, so bear with me. Negative 32. So still the same answer. Not a point on, not a solution, but it is a point on the graph. Sorry, so this one's an 11 yeah. and then a negative 32. I don't know why they don't give us an eraser. I guess I could put a little blo a block on top of it. There we go. Much better. Okay. <laughs> so it's just me. Bad math. So if it asks you to determine whether the given binomial expression is a factor, because we had a remainder, it's not a factor. Everybody okay with the connecting those two ideas? Let's try another example. This time it says given that negative 3 is a 0, hmm, it wants us to factor my problem. So let's first set up my synthetic division. But here's my question to you, everyone, whether you're at home or in person. Think for a minute. What number am I going to put out here? So just think in your head for just a minute. If you're at home, can you type in your answer for me? What is going to go in my bubble? It's telling us that this is a zero. Anyone in person want to take a guess? Okay, so let me ask it this way. Do you factors or solutions go outside? Are you sure? Solutions, solutions go outside. So is zero a solution? Is that another word for solution? It is. So negative three is what's going to go right out here. Can we compare this to the last one real fast? Just so we see the difference? Okay, the last one said, determine whether the given binomial is a factor. So since it had the x plus two, I had to change it to the minus two. Do we see the difference in how they asked the question? This time they just say, given that negative 3 is a 0. If it's a 0, it gets to go right out there. Now let's set up our long division. So Kayla, can you give me my coefficients this time? It'll be a 1. Yeah. Good job. That means Good? Okay. Fabulous. So let's drop our 1 straight down. And let me give you guys just about 20 seconds to try your synthetic division. Everybody again? We should have gotten a zero because it's telling us it is a zero. It's telling us that it works. So let's think about what information we have now. We know that negative three zero is a solution. Everybody agree with that statement? Because that's my point, right? Negative three zero, so we know it's a solution. How would I write it as a factor though? So if negative three is my solution, what would my factor be? X. How do I put it back inside the parentheses? Positive 3. Good job. Everybody okay with that idea? So factors and solutions are always opposite of each other. So this problem is actually asking me to factor f of x. So, so far I found one factor. I found that x plus 3 is a factor. Last week we talked briefly about what happens to the remainder of our problem, how we rewrite the rest of our problem. So since I started with an x cubed and I've taken one x out now, now I would be at x squared. So we're going to take our coefficients and rewrite it. So this 1 is going to be a 1x squared. Just stick with me. It'll make more sense in a second. My next term is going to become my x. And my last term becomes my constant. So think about what we did. We found that negative 3 was a solution. So I wrote that as a factor because it's asking me to factor it. 
once I knew that I can pull one X out, your answer to your synthetic division is what's left over. So we rewrite it taking one away from my highest exponent. So if I started at three and I've taken one out, now I'm at two, one, and zero. Since my problem says to factor completely, this is when last semester is going to come into play, I still have to factor this x squared. Do we remember last semester? We used to call it the magic diamond. Some people had other ways of factoring quadratics. What I need to find are two numbers that multiply to two but add to a negative three. Remember, we used to do this all the time last semester. So I need two numbers that add to two, sorry, multiply to two, but add to negative three. So we used to write it like this. Multiply to two, but add to a negative three. Can we think of what numbers would do that? It's been a while. <laughs> Aren't there only two numbers that multiply to two? Would everybody agree with that? What multiplies to two? One. A one and a two. But let's check my diamond. So one times two is two, but is one plus two a negative three? Hmm, so I'm not quite there yet. So rethink. How can I change my one and my two that they'll add to a negative three? Oh, make them both negative. So let's try is negative 1 plus negative 2 negative 3? Yes. Is negative 1 times a negative 2 a positive 2? Yes. You guys just found your answers. So back into my parentheses, I'm going to have a negative 1 and a negative 2. Now it's factored completely. So this second part of my problem is what we ended last semester with. So if we still need practice on that, I can absolutely help you. Just come see me. So our whole purpose is that when I have an x cubed, I first have to find one factor that works. Then I can go back and use that magic diamond formula that we learned last semester. So at this point, this is factored completely. It's been a while, right? We're like, whoa, I feel rusty after three weeks of Christmas break. <laughs> okay, so great job. Let's keep on trucking. So we're going to try one more. It's very, very similar. It says factor the polynomial equation with the given zero. So it's telling me that x is 5 is a zero. So remember like last time, if it's a zero, what number am I going to put out in front? Good. So 5 is a zero, so I'm going to put my 5 out there. So let me give you guys a moment to do your synthetic division. Second semester kind of combines everything that we learned first semester and we jump right in with new stuff. And it's telling us that it's a zero, which means you should get zero remainder. Because it's telling us it's going to work. Okay, so Alex, what coefficients did you put out in front? Mm -hmm. Negative seven. Good. Seven. Perfect. So I wasn't missing any. I had my x cubed, x squared, x to my number. So let's see what we get. Everybody good? So 5, 0 is a solution, which is awesome, which means what is my factor? So if 5 was a solution, I would have to say x minus 5 is the factor. Right? Solutions and factors are always opposites of each other. 
Now we're going to rewrite the rest of my equation. This will become 1x squared minus 2x minus 3. Again, my original question still said factor. So I found one factor. I found that x minus 5 is a factor. But my second part of my problem still needs to be broken down because I have an x squared. So try your magic diamond again. I'll give you a minute to think about it. I'm looking for two numbers that multiply to negative 3 but add to a negative 2. So if you want to write your symbols in above those, sometimes it's helpful. It's always multiplying to C and adding to B. So try and see if you can find your two factors in there. And for June, McKenna, and Esmeralda, if you guys get those and want to type them in, that would be great. Really good job. So the only two things that multiply to 3 is a 3 and a 1. So how can you make the 3 negative and the 2 negative? The 3 would have to be the negative. The 1 would have to be the positive. So it would be a negative 3 and a positive 1. So that's called factoring completely. So you're going to get some good practice with last semester's, um, last semester's content <laughs> before we move much further. Questions on this one? I'll pause for people at home. You guys good here? Okay, great. Okay, watch this one. Nope, I, you don't even need to write this one. Watch how easy this is. If it says find the root, root means what? Let's give me another word for root. Root means what? Solutions. Root means x-intercepts. All these things. They've factored it for you. Ooh, that's fabulous. They factored it for us. If I have my factors, in two seconds you guys can give me the solution. Am I right or am I not right? What are my solutions when they have it factored for us? Negative 4, negative 1, negative 1. I love it when they have it factored for us because finding the root is easy. Isn't that so nice? So sometimes on a quiz, they're going to give you the factors and say, what are the roots? They're just trying to check so you know to take the opposite. That's all they're checking. They're checking for understanding. Wasn't that pretty awesome? We like when they factor it for us. They've done the hard part. Let's think about what these really mean on a graph. What is a root? What is a solution? What is an x-intercept? These are the spots where your graph is going to cross the x-axis. Oh, that's kind of cool. So these graphs are going to do crazy, curvy things, and all of your solutions are going to be the spots where the graph crosses. So this one's going to cross at negative 4, negative 1, and negative 1. And you're thinking, how can it cross two times at this number right here? It actually, instead of crossing, it touches and comes back up. So whenever we have two at the same spot, you're going to find out later this unit that it actually just touches that spot and goes back up. Kind of cool. So what's this last one going to look like? If these were my three factors for my last problem, let's just do a really quick sketch. Watch how easy it's going to be. This one's going to cross at a positive 5 a positive 3, and a negative 1. This one's going to look something like that. Isn't that cool? You know a lot just by finding those, those roots, those intercepts. So sometimes they're going to give it to you in factored form. We love when they do that for us. It's fabulous. Sometimes we have to find the factors ourselves. So what if I give you the graph? Can you guys pick out the roots? So what am I really asking you for? I'm asking you to find the spots where the graph crosses. Can we easily pick those spots up? It's not that they're hard questions on your quizzes and tests. They just want to see, do you know your vocabulary? Do you know what they're asking you for? So let me highlight those three spots. I would have one right here, one right here, and one right here. So let's think of how we would write that answer, though. So my solutions are negative 1, 3, and 5, but how would I write them as factors? I want to make sure you guys know both. If a solution is negative 1, what would be that factor? x plus 1. The, x, the 3 would become an 
minus 3, and the 5? X minus 5. X minus 5. Great job. So see from a graph, you guys are not only able to tell me the solutions, but you can also tell me the factors. Wasn't that way easier than doing synthetic division and finding these factors? Way easier. So some places are going to look just like that. Hopefully that makes your day, makes you happy, but you'd be surprised at how many students struggle with it just because you don't understand the vocabulary. Really good job. We have one more that we're going to end today with. Are there any questions so far? So far so good. You're going to end the week with graphing these yourself. So I know, kind of seems kind of scary, but next week we'll practice that together. So there's this thing called the rational root theorem. You don't need to copy this down because as we all know, we could read something and if the vocabulary doesn't make sense, we're not going to understand what they're telling us to do. So I'm going to put it into practice and show you how to do these. And I'm actually going to skip example six. We're going to go to example seven. So if you're following along in your notes, this will be the last one for the day. It's example seven. And we're going to list the possible rational roots. So notice this time, do they tell me any of the factors? No. Do they tell me any of the solutions? No. So if I'm trying to do synthetic division for this problem, I don't even know what number to try out here. They didn't tell me what number to try. So we have this theorem called the rational root theorem. So everybody take a quick second and copy that problem down. We're going to end today with this one. So in this case, they did not tell me the factors, they didn't tell me solutions, I don't even know what number to try for my synthetic division. So because they don't give us any information, there's that thing that we saw in the last slide called the rational roots theorem. And what the rational roots theorem is, is it's going to tell us what numbers to try in here. So it's kind of cool, kind of useful. And here's the formula. It is plus or minus P over Q. Now what's P and Q? P is all of the factors of your constant. So go ahead and write down what's in blue because it makes more sense than the way that the theorem is written, I think. <laughs> and then Q is all of the factors of your leading coefficient. So plus or minus P over Q, P stands for the factors of your constant, Q stands for your factors of your leading coefficient. So what does that mean? Let's try. P over Q. So P says it's your constant. I'm going to highlight the constant. So maybe on your paper if you guys can circle it. Your constant is always the number that's all by itself with no variables. That's your constant. So think in your head, what times what can give you 2? What are your factors of 2? 1 or 2. 1 times 2. On the bottom is Q, factors of your leading coefficient. So what that means is the number that's in front of your highest variable. So X cubed is my highest variable, so my leading coefficient would be the 3 that's out in front. So can you guys tell me what times what would be 3? What's going to go on bottom? One or three. So how, what am I supposed to do with this now? So let me show you. These are my possible numbers that I'm supposed to try for my synthetic division. But notice that this is a fraction. So here's how you work it out. We're going to take our one and put it over the one. So one over one or one over three are two of my options. One over one or one over three. Now I'm going to do the same thing with the two. Or it could be 2 over 1 or 2 over 3. So I know this is new. I believe you guys learned this tomorrow. So I'm just sort of prepping you a little bit for what you're going to learn tomorrow. So once you write your P over Q, you're going to take all of your P's and put them over all of your Q's. You take all of your P's and put them over all of your Q's. Here are my four answer options. So let's kind of reduce this a little bit. One over one looks funny. So I can really say one, one third, two, or two thirds. Are you okay with me doing that? I just took the one away from my denominator. 
and all of my answers could be plus or minus. Plus or minus, plus or minus, plus or minus, plus or minus. So really, how many options do I have to plug in here? I have eight. Positive one, negative one. Positive one third, negative one third. Positive two, negative two, positive two thirds, negative two thirds. I have eight possible options to try for my synthetic division. Good thing we're not doing long division. Long division eight times would be crazy. Synthetic division, you're not going to have to do it eight times. So don't look at me and say, oh my gosh, there's eight times to do synthetic division. Nope. You only got to find one that works because when you find one that works, guess what we do? I'm going back a little bit. When we found one that worked, guess what we did? We rewrote the rest of the problem and we were able to use the magic diamond. So when you guys get to these problems in your homework or on the online lesson, the first time you try one, it may not work. You try negative one, hey, negative one worked. The minute you find one that works, you're going to rewrite the rest of the problem and use the magic diamond. So it's not as long as it first appears. So I just wanted to make sure you guys were aware of that. So no, you should not be doing synthetic division eight times. <laughs> You're just going to do it until you find one that works, and then you will have the remainder of your answer. Sometimes, look what the question says. List the possible rational roots. That's what we did. It's not even forcing me to do the problem. It's just wanted to know, are you able to find your possible roots? So just be really really careful about what the question is asking for. So that one is what we are actually going to end our time with today. We're going to save graphing for next week. I know I had it in the PowerPoint, like in the notes that I shared with you guys, but this is a lot of information at one time, and I want to give you a chance to practice it first. So let's come to the essential question for the day. And again, if you're in person, yay, you automatically get your full points for being here in person, taking good notes, it's a good reason to be here. But I want to know, what does it mean to factor completely? And then how do you use your factors when graphing? So remember a couple of times I was showing you in parentheses, after you factored completely, right, when we had these, x plus 2, x minus 1, x plus 4, that's factoring completely. But how did I know I factored it completely? And then what do I do with these to turn it into a graph? We talked briefly about that. What do you do with these factors to put it on the graph? So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. You guys have a great day, and I will see you next week. Make sure you put your answer in the Dropbox.